In Unit 5, Module 2, we're going to look at our first tool for making economic decisions about investment decisions. And the tool we're going to use is called Decision Trees. And that tool comes from a branch of math called Decision Theory. There's a great book which is in the uh, reading, which I recommend you take a look at, especially in the context of your assignment this week called The Decision Tree Primer by Craig Kirkwood. And this is a quote from page one of his Decision Tree Primer. He says, the analysis of complex decisions with significant uncertainty can be confusing because, number one, the consequence that will result from selecting any specified decision alternative cannot be predicted with certainty. Number two, there are often a large number of different factors and that must be taken into account when making the decision. Three, it may be useful to consider the possibility of reducing the uncertainty in the decision by collecting additional information. And four, a decision maker's attitude towards risk taking can impact the relative desirability of different alternatives. You can also use decision theory to model things like the value of information, which we will look at later on in this unit. That's very useful because it helps us work out how much money we should spend on an experiment to test one of our assumptions. So modeling these things mathematically is, is hugely useful at considering the impact of our actions and, and helping us make good decisions. The arithmetic for decision trees is straightforward. Uh, it is just arithmetic, there's no calculus or anything fancy, and it builds on something that we already looked at back in Unit 1, which is the risk matrix. If you cast your mind back to Unit 1, we talked about how you can model risk mathematically by multiplying probability with impact. And we did an exercise in the first week of class where we built a risk matrix. So, this is the basis of decision trees. It's modeling risk by taking the probability between zero and one and the impact in dollars. The thing to bear in mind that is particularly important that we haven't really talked about is that risk can be not just downside risk, something bad happening. It can also be upside risk or something good happening. And we will look at both upside risk and downside risk in the context of decision trees. Risks can work out well, they can make you money. Risks can work out badly and they can lose you money. So we're going to start with a very simple example. As a product manager, you have a decision to make. You can either build a temperature sensor for your uh, Internet of Things device or you can build a pressure sensor. And we've got some things to uh, take into account in our model. Firstly, there's the development cost of building each sensor. And then secondly, there's the revenue that we believe that sensor will make on the market. And then thirdly, there's a probability of actually getting that outcome, that revenue outcome. So armed with these three bits of information, we can model this decision. So the temperature sensor costs $100,000 to make. The expected revenue is $1 million and the probability of succeeding is 0.5. The pressure sensor, on the other hand, has a development cost of $10,000, a predicted revenue of $400,000, and a probability of success of 0.8. Now, you're probably thinking at this point, how do we come up with these numbers? And the answer is, you don't have to come up with them with a high degree of precision. If you come up with numbers to the nearest $100,000 or uh, around that amount in the context of this model, you're doing just fine. And actually, it's not the exact numbers that are the point of this exercise. It's recording the assumptions that you're making in coming up with these numbers and then testing those assumptions. And again, this is a theme in this class. We've talked about this before. So when you see this and you're like, well, how do these numbers come up? You need to come up with some numbers and you need to make some assumptions in coming up with those numbers and then you'll test those assumptions. But those numbers are not going to be precise, and that's okay. It doesn't matter. We can still make good decisions with imperfect information, and that's what we'll show in this exercise. So once you've got this information, you can build a decision tree. And this is what a decision tree looks like for this problem. So we're going to start on the left-hand side. This square indicates the, the root of our decision tree. And we've got three possible options. We can build a temperature sensor, we can build the pressure sensor, or we can build neither. So moving from left to right, the next step is to write down the development cost. So for the 
Tempers for the temperature sensor, the development cost is $100,000. For the pressure sensor, the development cost is $10,000. And of course, if we don't do either, the development cost is zero. Now we have this circle which indicates a, this, a, um, an outcome with a probability. So with a probability of 0 0.5, we could succeed in developing the temperature sensor. That would give us a revenue of a million dollars. Or with a probability of 0 0.5, we could fail, which would give us a revenue of zero. And what we do here is on the far right hand side, we calculate the profit. So we do this by taking the revenue and subtracting the development cost. So for the temperature sensor, if the revenue is a million dollars and the development cost is $100,000, the net profit is $900,000. The next line down, if it's a failure, then the net profit is minus $100,000. Moving on to the pressure sensor, we do exactly the same thing. Um, that has an outcome of success with a probability of 0 0.8 and a revenue of 400,000, which give, would give us a net profit of 390,000. And then there's the possibility of failure with a probability of 0 0.2, which would give us a revenue of zero and a net profit of minus $10,000. And then at the bottom, um, if we choose to do neither, our net profit is zero. So we've gone from left to right. And on the far right hand side, we've got our net profit. The next thing we're going to do is calculate what's called the expected value of each possible choice we make. We're going to calculate the expected value of the temperature sensor. We're going to calculate the expected value of the pressure sensor, and we're going to cal calculate the expected value of building neither. The expected value is also known as the probability weighted average. In other words, the risk. So to calculate the expected value, we multiply the net profit by the probability, and then we add up the possible options within that choice to get the expected value. So for the temperature sensor, we multiply the net profit for success, 900,000, with 0 0.5. And then to that, we add the net profit in the failure path, which is minus 100,000 multiplied by the probability, which is 0 0.5. And when we do that, we get an expected value of $400,000 for building the temperature sensor. So again, to get the expected value for building the temperature sensor, we multiply the net profit for the success outcome with the probability. And then to that, we add the net profit of the failure path multiplied by the probability. So that is 900 times 0 0.5, which is 450K plus minus 100k times 0 0.5, which is minus 50k, which gives us an expected value of $400,000, or probability weighted average. Now let's look at the pressure sensor. We're going to do exactly the same thing again. We're going to multiply 390k by 0 0.8, and then add minus 10k multiplied by 0 0.2 to give us an expected value of $310,000 for this path. Then we can get the expected value of our final option, which is neither, which is zero. So what this tells us is that the rational choice when making this de decision is to build the temperature sensor because that has an expected value or risk of $400,000. The pressure sensor is a less, less good choice because that only has an expected value of $310,000. And then building neither gives us an expected value of zero and is our worst option. Okay, now I'm going to give you an exercise to do. If you read down in YouTube into the description, you will find a link to a Google Doc where you have an exercise that you can complete. I strongly recommend you do this exercise to get some practice. I will reveal the solution in the next module in this unit, but I strongly recommend you do the exercise. It should take you about 30 minutes um, and then I'll go through it in the next exercise. The reason that I want you to do it is because your homework is on this and I want you to get some practice. Um, if you want, you can do this exercise with other people in your class. Uh, feel free to grab it and um, work on it with someone else. Uh, it can often be more fun to do these things in a group context. Um, but make sure you do the exercise 
in the description on YouTube before you watch the next module, because at the beginning of the next module, I will reveal the answer and how the calculation works. Good luck.